welcome uh, to the first talk today in this room. Uh, Alpa Bajaran will give an introduction to exploit development yeah. for newbies. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, welcome. How many of you were at my presentation yesterday? Wow. <laughs> okay. So I just would like to go over the, the highlight for I think there are one or two people that were not there. Just you know, to go over the thing. Well, the main idea was that I'm um, Turkish and these are Turkish delights. So <laughs> again, if you could just pass them around. That was the important part, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, today we are going to talk about exploit development for noobs. But, you know, as I always say, I'm not a hacker. I'm a penetration tester. So uh, I had to learn these things. And it took me some time, so I'm just going to explain it the way I learned it. So it might be boring for some of us, interesting for others. Sorry, anyway. So I arrived in uh, Serbia uh, two days ago, and uh, this was <laughs> the first thing I saw at the airport. And, you know, it, this was the question I'm always asking. How come we still cannot write a decent piece of software, you know, software that doesn't fail? Why, you know, it's 2015 already, and we still write software with bugs and errors, and that is still hackable. I mean, is it just our company that cannot do that? I just compiled some examples. Here, uh, Mars Climate Orbiter was launched in, uh, in December 98. It was supposed to reach Mars and, you know, turn around the, or orbit Mars uh, for some time in order to gather information on uh, the climate. What happened is that it entered the orbit lower than it was planned, and it crashed. So it w this was like uh, $300 million piece of software that crashed because the coder who was writing the code, he, during this uh, trajectory calculation, he just took two different units of measure and he uh, multiplied them. So the result was something very strange, and uh, it crashed. Again, Mariner was uh, planned to go to Venus, Venus for, you know, to look around. I think they have things that look like seas, and we wanted to know if there were fish in it, maybe. And uh, the guy who wrote the code told that this line, in fact, which I don't even know what it is. Someone told me once it was Fortran, but I don't know. So this line, he thought it was a line between two words in the upper line, so instead of a mathematical formula like this. And this also uh, satellite had to be destroyed because it uh, deviated from the trajectory and instead of going to space, it was going on a city and they had to blow it up. Knight was a company that bought and sold uh, stock in the United States. And they had some servers that did this automatically. So if they found a stock that was lower than it should be, it bought it, and when the price went up, it sold it. It did this automatically for uh, as long as it could. And they decided to update this software, and without testing it, they deployed the update. And what happened is that in around 30 minutes, they lost 400, over $400 million because the software was buying high and selling when the prices dropped. So, again, uh, mistake. And more mistakes that, you know, we are familiar with. Uh, well, Heartbleed, Ghost, these are the two one, ones that have their own logos, which is interesting for a bug, and uh, Adobe Flash Player. So, what happens, what makes us, you know, not able to write code that doesn't have flaws? There are three main reasons. One, the softwares are complicated, really. Uh, it becomes more and more complicated. You know, if you were going to write a f software for a fridge, for example, right? Uh, software for a fridge, you would think temperature and maybe the, the gas in it. But today, the fridge, you know, we know that they can st send emails or, you know, check your schedule. So <laughs> this is not something you would think of when writing a software for a fridge. And they are very easily expandable. By expandable, I don't mean that it can be integrated with other solutions. It's just it grows so fast and so much that you don't even notice it while you are writing the code. And 
the last point is that yes, we are trying to connect everything to the internet, so it becomes dangerous. Complicated, yes, you know, we spoke about uh, satellites just a few minutes ago. So Curiosity has around 5 million lines of code. And, you know, Windows 3.1, if we were, you know, if we decided to write a Windows 3.1, we'd have to write over 2 million lines of code. Today, well, uh, the Office 2013 has over 40 million lines of code, and Facebook is at 61 million lines of code and growing. So why should we, uh, why would these lines of code be interesting? Because statistics shows that, that on any piece of software that was uh, sold or, you know, uh, distributed professionally, that is, there are around 50, 15 and 50, between 15 and 50 errors for every 1,000 lines of codes. So that's why uh, the line of codes is an important uh, parameter for us. The clean room technique, this is how NASA and uh, the other big guys, they are developing their software. Even them, they are not at zero errors. So we make errors while we are writing the codes. And what does it mean for us in security? It means that on any uh, client in our network, we have around 100 uh, 50,000 uh, errors that can be potentially exploited. Uh, we, we said that expansion was very easy, that uh, you know, we didn't even notice it sometimes, just to give you a, an idea about this. You know, if I was going to use Python and you know, print a number, I want a number on that screen, you know, the thing I could do would be this, right? But if I decided I wanted a random number. What I could do was import a function called random and then just print it from using that uh, function. Yes, say I want a number between 1 and 10. This is you know, the way I could do it. So just two lines of code and it allows me to print uh, random numbers on the screen. This is what we have just seen. But when I said import random, I just included this into my two lines of code. So all this, which I didn't write, which I didn't audit, which I have no idea about what it's doing, except that it's, it tries to provide me with a random number, I included 692 lines of code in my two lines. So in fact, my two lines here, there are 694 lines of code. So that's why it's getting out of hand really easily or really quickly. And of course, we are trying to connect everything to the internet. This is you know, a good thing for some, uh, not so good thing for others. The idea of connecting everything to the internet was a good idea, in fact, but we decided to do it probably in the most stupid way we could, because someone came up with the idea of browsers. Uh, we said that we are going to use browsers. Uh, in my talk yesterday, I said that, OK, this is our security posture. We are trying to protect ourselves from whatever is coming from the internet using this layered approach. So we have the firewall, the IPS. You know, I said it was like in the Middle Ages when you were trying to protect your castle. And that attackers today, instead of going you know, uh, security measure from security measure, they just popped in the middle of the network out of nowhere. So one of the ways they do it is using browsers. They attack the browser, so they send a link or uh, an email to one of our users, and the user clicks on it. Because the guy, or whoever decided that browser were a good idea, he said that he would create something that would run on my computer, but go and find codes on the internet and run them on my computer. So this is what the browser does. So the browser goes and finds uh, codes somewhere else, codes I don't know. Uh, it can receive comments so from the internet. It can. Uh, redirect to other commands, so I'm trying to visit one page, it's redirected, the browser redirects, and I have lots of ads on, applications, and updates, so it's basically, I'm open to the internet. Things are getting easier for attackers as well. Anyone knows what this is? Yeah, it's a blue box, right? In 1976, if I wanted to call myself a hacker, I would need one of these. So I could either uh, make one, or, you know, because I'm a skip script kiddie, I'm a noob, I would have to buy one. And to buy one, I would have to go to a university, find the guy who made them and sold them, 
because these were not very legal, so it was not easy to find these guys. And buy one, you know, take all this risk of going to jail and money, etc. Today, if I want to be a hacker, all I have to do is, you know, <laughs> Google it. So attacking has become much easier as well. So we said complexity, expansion, and connections, connectivity is uh, making everything more dangerous for us. That's not all. We, have, we are starting to see that browsers, for example, I just gave the example, they are becoming part of the operating system. You are running Explorer without even no noticing it on uh, Windows. Uh, when we are going mobile, we have distributed systems, we have more and more web applications, so everything is becoming more and more difficult for us. So if we were able to write code that didn't have any bugs in it, we would be in trouble already with all this because you know, we are trying to connect everything to everything, etc. But we are also not able to code and design uh, software correctly. Uh, this is uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. She, she found a bug in one of her computers and she taped it in her uh, logs. Some say that this is where the name bug came, comes from. Uh, well, for us, a bug is not important. There can be a bug in a software. It wouldn't matter security-wise because, you know, it happens. Where it starts to become a problem for us is when an attacker can take advantage of this vulnerability. He or she can exploit that vulnerability. And I'm talking about, you know, errors in coding, but coders are not, are not the only reason we are having problems. We also have some issues designing secure software. So we cannot design it securely and we cannot code it securely. So that's why we are having problems. Errors that come from the code, sometimes they come from uh, functions we are using. Um, you might say that, okay, most of the compilers today, they take care of buffer overflow, but still most of the software we are using today were uh, developed or designed or in a part of them were developed or designed before all these controls, so we still have dangerous functions in them. And bad error handling is also an issue for us, just to give an example of um, bad error handling. Again, from uh, yesterday's course, this is a screen that wants me to write an ID and it gives me back the, the ID that uh, corresponds to it. So where bad error handling comes in is that if I give, him, give it a single code, it will give me an error message saying that, okay, uh, the problem is here, and by here, it will tell me, show me part of the code that is running behind it, so I will be able to attack it. This is a good example of bad error handling. A rather better uh, way to handle errors, still not perfect, but here I have something that asks for uh, an ID. But I can try to trick it using a number. It will not return anything. Okay. I will still try my single code, see if I can get it to talk to me. Well, it still changes because as you can notice, I don't have the, the table anymore, but it doesn't give me the line of code that is running or the error as the other one did. So this is, you know, it can be considered better error handling. So things that we don't normally notice when we are coding, you know, what would happen if the software has an error in it, they can be very important for the attacker. And the design, of course, we share modules with other software, we share modules with other uh, networks. We don't use safe data transfer protocols, so why encode something when we are transferring it, right? We, we don't bother doing it. And uh, we have problem also managing all uh, that is related to user session and authentication. We need to start thinking about security the moment we have the idea of a software, so you can come up with a brilliant idea for a new uh, mobile application. You know, if we sell one million mobile application for one euro that makes one million euro, it's good business. The moment you have this idea, you should start thinking about uh, security. That's where uh, it starts. And also something that we forget about is security after the release. So once the software is out there, um, 
things change because the attacker, he will not care, you know, you, are, you might be waiting for a number or a, an input, anything, but the attacker, he will try or she will try to give you something else so that it generates an error, so that it makes a mistake, so that it crashes. And we need to be able to understand the attacker's point of view, so if you think you have put a measure somewhere, the attacker will find a way to go around that. So what does he or she need to be able to attack your or hack your software? It needs an injection vector, so somewhere where he or she can send an input, just as we have seen, a single code or a letter or a number. He needs an activation zone, this is where this input will be handled. He needs an output and a feedback, so uh, somewhere to send the attack code, somewhere just uh, to send a single code, as we have just seen. He, she will try to understand what different types of inputs are accepted or rejected. So just now we have seen that numbers were okay to some extent, but commas were not, or single quotes were not. And obviously it should produce an observable result. So if it didn't change anything when I put a single quote, then I would not be able to tell that there was an SQL injection uh, flow there. But since when I put the single quote, the table disappeared, I was able to tell that, okay, something's changing. I need somewhere to run this attack code, so it can be a database back there, it can be a DLL, anything. I need an output, of course, just to see, understand how it uh, goes. And, of course, I will need a feedback. For example, if it was an SQL injection, I would need you know, the, the information on that table. Or if I was trying to attack an exe or an executable file, I would need you know, a remote shell or something. Okay, let's go over uh, quickly the steps of an attack. This is sometimes uh, close, uh, in fact, close to the what is sometimes referred as to a hacking cycle, but there's a it starts with target selection and goes all the way to exploiting. I can find, the attacker can find the targets in many different ways. You can scan the network or scan the ports or just uh, fuzz. We will just see an example now. And find the error that he or she could exploit and you know, place the backdoor and delete traces. This is what we would expect when we are talking about a net attacking a network or attacking a web application, but when uh, we are attacking uh, the executable files or you know, any piece of software, we need, or even with web application hacking, we need to reverse engineering. So we need to understand what the guy who coded it was thinking. And we have seen that he was thinking that you know, people can write their names, it's okay, people can write an a letter, it's okay, but maybe he didn't think about people putting a single quote there. So we need to understand how he was thinking and what he was thinking when he was developing the, the software. Okay. And we talk about security just to uh, have the basics. We can say that any application is secure if it only does what he has to do and he does everything it has to do. So these are two criteria. If your software fulfills those two criteria, yes, we can say it's a secure software. But if I can find a way, uh, yesterday we had seen an example about with code execution. So it was supposed just to send pink packets, but we were able to, you know, to download a file using it. So this was something that he did more than it should, and it should do everything that it should. Um, as I said, secure development starts when we first have the idea, or it should start. Usually, it, it's not, it doesn't work that way. That's why we have all these problems. But it should start the moment I have the idea, or the moment I begin my development process. And at that stage, I should be able to understand all my security risks. That's how I will design a software that will cover all my risks. And be even before I come to secure coding practices, you know, not using dangerous functions or handling input or about sanitizing input, all these things, I need also to choose a security architecture. How will I keep my, uh, say we are talking about a web application, how will I keep it secure? Where will I put my controls? And then test, of course, uh, 
before shipping, I'm a penetration tester, so most of the web applications I test, I test them after they have been you know, coded and finished almost, some of them after they have been deployed. So when I find a bug or an error, it's very difficult and sometimes almost impossible to fix them. But if I had discovered them at the beginning when you know, it was just designed or you know, between two uh, sc uh, sprints of the development, it would have been much easier to go to the source code and change whatever uh, created the problem. I will not bore you with all these things, but you know, to be able to say that, yes, we are at least trying to have secure coding practices, I need to control my inputs. I need to control the user authentication. Error handling, as we have seen, you know, for us, it's just an error. It just shows that the software is not working or will not do what the, the user is asking for, but the attacker will see it in a different way and maybe use it uh, to conduct an attack. Secure protocols and password management, all this I have to think about during uh, the coding. Okay. So why do we do reverse engineering? Why are we trying to understand how a solution works or how any piece of software works? First of all, we might do it just to understand, the, uh, say someone is trying to sell me a firewall, just to understand if the firewall will do everything I'm uh, expecting for it, I might try to reverse engineer it to a s some extent. Uh, if I'm developing, say, an, for example, a piece of hardware for an iPhone, then I would maybe need to reverse engineer some part of that iPhone so that my component will be integrated and will work with uh, that other piece. I do it to discover vulnerabilities. This is where uh, the bad guys work. They don't care about developing hardware for iPhones, obviously. and discover undocumented functions. Everyone knows that there are tons and tons of functions that are not documented, that are used by developers or you know, R&D department, but that will not appear in your uh, user manual. For reverse engineering, there are a couple of things. W now we are talking about applications and application security. So uh, when it comes to reverse engineering, maybe there are things that can help me. One of them is source code analysis. I could audit the code, the source code, and try to find, try to see if there are any functions that could be dangerous, that could lead to a compromise, things like that. Uh, and just to give you an idea, one tool I can use to do it is uh, called RATS. Uh, I think it's uh, raw auditing tool, something, something, I forgot the name, sorry. And just let me clear that, just a sec. So I'll just run it on uh, the Clam antivirus. Anyone is using it or heard about it? C L A M. It's yeah. Uh, what do you think? It's a decent piece of antivirus. Are you using it? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, great. Okay. So let's see if there are any things, uh, anything that could be dangerous on the code. So this is uh, the code I'm gonna. Uh, Look at clam scan and under clam scan, I have uh, manager.c. I'll just uh, because rats is good with uh, C code, so okay. Here is the output. It found some, you know, uh, vulnerabilities that are problems that it considers high. For example, here on several lines, it found a fixed size local buffer. So we will just see an example of a buffer overflow and where it can go. He thinks that this uh, function will lead in a, uh, the way it is used will lead in a, uh, to a buffer overflow. And then again, sprintf, you know, it tells me that to make sure that the argument that is passed with this function, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just by looking at the source code without even uh, trying to work on the executable or to reverse engineer the executable, I can just audit the source code and see if um, anything goes wrong or anything is a bit risky. I say that we, it's 2015 and we still cannot write you know, a decent piece of software. The main reason is that the, the industry as such is not uh, a real industry, one might say, because if 
uh, say we go with the example of fridges. We bought a fridge, we, we come home, we plug it, it doesn't work. So what do you do? You, you take it back, yeah? You don't, you know, maybe open the door, close it, see if it starts working or... <laughs> because, you know, we, we buy software and it crashes and we reboot it and everything goes to normal, right? We don't take back the software, we don't say, hey, Windows, this <laughs> piece of software crashed, please take it back and give me one that doesn't crash. We cannot say this. So this is... And if you read these guarantees, software guarantees, you will see that most of the time there are none. So <laughs> that's one of the problems. The manufacturer, he doesn't take any responsibility. Yeah, that's the case. And we don't have anyone that checks for software. For example, if there's a plane accident, there are people that start looking into it. So why did it happen? How did it happen? What can we do so that it doesn't happen again? But when your windows crashes, no one comes to your home and checks this. So this is one of the reasons that everything is so difficult. Just an overview of the software development cycle. Yeah, we need some requirements. So we said that we are going to develop a mobile application. We will sell one million of them to, for one euro each, and it will be our first million. So we will have some requirements there. And then we will design it. We will design how it works. We will design the user interface. We will start coding it, and then testing it, and deploying it, hopefully waiting for a million euros. The ones in yellow are the steps in which we include vulnerabilities. So if we don't make any mistakes on these three steps, then we are sure that in testing and deplo deployment, we will be almost OK. Uh, so these are the three most critical steps for us. I talked about uh, fuzzing. Fuzzing is basically uh, throwing a lot of information to the software and hoping it crashes or gives an output that is not expected so we can work on it. And there are several reasons I do it. I just fuzz it maybe to find a target. So I just download an executable file from the internet. I start fuzzing it, see if it's exploitable or not, just uh, to play around. Um, but for the fuzzing process, I just, yeah, I need the executable, as I said, or you know, anything I can fuzz. Find the input fields. So where can I send input so that I start uh, this process? What will I send? Again, it's important. Start fuzzing, fuzzing. It depends on what you are uh, working against. It's, it can take just a few seconds, or it can take days, or maybe weeks. Observe the results and see if I can find anything uh, exploitable. Buffer overflows are rather easy to understand. That's why, you know, uh, as I understood them, I'm sure everyone understands them. So if I have, you know, eight letters, and I'm trying to uh, string copy them using the function string copy in C. I'm copying them to a buffer with a place for five. In the normal life, I would expect it you know, just to write five and drop the other three. Uh, right? This is what I would expect, because it has no room for it. But what happens is that it accepts the other three, and it writes them somewhere. So, and w we, as an attacker, what we need to do is find which three letters and where he uh, writes them. So why do buffer overflows occur? Well, you don't have any buffer control or you have too much buffer control. It happens. You use uh, functions that do not uh, that allow buffer overflow. And you don't use secure practices. So that's why we find them almost everywhere on any piece of software. So how uh, do we exploit it? We find the buffer overflow, so we find the place where it crashes. We uh, send the exploit, and we hope everything works. So how do we find vulnerability on any piece of software? Anyone working on this here? Or you know, finding vulnerabilities, hunting bugs, and no? OK. So you can start working on it. It's very easy. All you have to do is use, you know, these are op uh, free solutions, some of them open source. Vuln server was developed specially uh, for this situation so that you can download it. It's an executable file. It has one DLL, so it helps you learn these things. Immunity debugger is a debugger we're going, we are going to see. And, of course, Python, which is <laughs> my favorite language. This is what immunity debugger looks like. So you have your assembly code, your registers, the stack, 
and the x. Uh, maybe we can just go over it. I think it will be much better. So Windows is in Turkish, but I think we'll be able to understand each other. This is uh, one server, so it's not very impressive. It just says it's waiting for uh, client connections. It, it's listening on port 9999. Okay, and uh, I'm going to attack it using Kali Linux. And okay, uh, just to first connect it, maybe just a second. Um, it says, welcome to vulnerable server, enter help for help, enter help, and it lists all the functions. The one we are trying to, we will try to use is Tron, and it doesn't do anything, but you just, you can just send it a bunch of A's, and it just does whatever it is. So what I'm going to try to do is see if I can get this uh, one server to crash. You know, it has seen my connection. So let's see if I can get it uh, to crash. I could do this manually, you know, write all the A's in the world I could. But it would not be very feasible. So I just wrote this. So uh, it's very easy. It has a server, a remote port. And what it does, it asks me for. Uh, a number and it sends that number of A over. So. Okay, length of attack, say 1000. Try and complete, goodbye. It, it didn't crash. So let's see if I can get it to crash with uh, 1500. Nope. 2000. Okay, I don't get any reply here, and yeah, it, it crashed. Now, I know that there's a problem, but I'm really not sure what the problem exactly is. So to, to be able to understand uh, the problem, I have to run, yes, one server, and I will also ha need my debugger. That's where the debugger comes in. So it will tell me what went wrong and uh, why it went wrong. Just let me find it. So for now, there is nothing on the screen because it's not attached to anything. I will just attach it to my one server process so that it will populate the screen with anything that is uh, related to one service. So as an attacker, uh, I will not bore you with all the details. But what is important for me is this. This is the place where the next command that will be executed is. So if I can change this, it means that the next command that this one server will do is whatever I'm sending it. So this is what I'm trying to do. See if I can make it crash again. Now it's paused. I will just run it. Or maybe I could just arrange the screen a little bit here. Oops. Just a second. Let me arrange the screen so that we have a better pictures.
So what is good uh, with the demos is that you can see what really is going on. What is bad is that most of the time they fail. So sorry about that. Anyway. Okay, still ugly, but you know, we said that this is what was important. So I just run it. It's running, and now what I will do on my uh, Kali machine is uh, try to make it crash again. So we know that at 2000 it crashed. So let's see uh, what really happened. Well, it crashed, yes. Uh, here, I can see that, uh, well, in fact, that's important for us. It says that it has an access violation when it tried to write to 41, 41, 41, and 41. So, going back to the boring presentation, this was the, the code that I sent, and it crashed, saying that it had uh, a problem trying to write to this address. And for those who know, 41 is hex for A. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, okay, thank you. So that the A's I sent him, some of them, he, the, the Vuln server, the, the software, thought that there were a place in the memory to write something, and it crashed trying to write there. It's interesting, but it's not exploitable. Why? Well, it might be exploitable, of course, but if it took this one of the A's or some of the A's as an instruction and you know as the next command to be executed, that would have been much more interesting for us. And I will just spare you the agony of uh, the demo once more. If I send 3,000 A's, then yes. Now I have a crush saying that it failed trying to execute those A's. So, okay, I know that somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 there are a bunch of A's that the application thinks are uh, commands to be executed. So if I can just find the place to where you know, this would happen, it would be easy for me to send them a command. So how do I do that? I create a piece of uh, text that doesn't repeat itself. So every four uh, bytes are unique so that I know where it failed. I just put it in my, uh, it's the same basically as the, the fuzzer, but instead of sending lots of A's or as many as A's I want, it first sends 1,000 A's and then this uh, unique characters. Yes, it crashes and we see that it crashed trying to execute this. Okay, uh, you've read Gulliver, yeah? It's, he's popular. So, you know the king that wanted his people to break eggs in a certain way? Uh, big Indian, little Indian? Okay, because Intel processors are called little Indians, this, in fact, is this. That's the way they write it in the memory. So they write it in starting from the end. And here are our magic. This is the magic place. So whatever I put here, it will be accepted as a command to be executed. And the location is at uh, 1006 bytes from the beginning. So what I need to do now is just send our 1000 A's, send and then uh, 1006 other bytes. So at uh, 2006 bytes, whatever I put there will be executed. Try if it works. I just put uh, my name here and as you can see, yes, that's the place I've checked it. The problem with uh, developing the exploit is that there are some characters I will not be able to use because the software or you know the, the whatever is that interprets the software will think these are comments for him and will do something. So just to be able to understand if there are any characters in the, that range, that uh, starting from zero going to 256, which are all the characters we can do with a computer. Oops. 
sorry about that. Um, I will just send you know my initial uh, 2006 characters. Then I will send all the characters I can, and then I will you know finish the rest because I need in fact 3,000 characters to make this exploit work. So if it's less than 3,000, it will not be the same crash. My exploitable piece of uh, memory will not be in the same location, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I need exactly 3,000. What I tell it is, okay, send 2006. Then my uh, what I want to be executed, and then all the characters you can. And for the rest, just put a bunch of Fs, you know, just to add it to 3,000. And when I run it, I see that the Fs don't arrive and are not executed, are not accepted. So one of the characters between amongst this were not was a bad character in fact was something that made the exploit fail it didn't work so this is a bit tricky it it might take some time or sometimes you might get lucky so now instead of starting at zero i start at one i say okay omit the first character don't use it see if the rest is good i run it yeah now i see that the f's and all the other characters reach the memory so it's okay the bad character, in fact, was uh, the null byte, the first one. So now that I know that something, uh, what I can change, and where it, I can find this thing I can change, I need uh, a command to put there. You know, writing my name is cool, but you know, it, it will not pay the bills. So as a hacker, I need something that will help me pay the bills, a virus or in a backdoor or something like that. And for this one, I can use uh, several comp components. I can find the command inside the executable file, or I can use one of the DLLs that uh, comes with the software. Here, uh, it's an add-on for Humanity Debugger called Mona, and it will list everything that this executable is using. Every these are things that I don't notice, so even the Windows kernel should be listed there, and it also shows uh, DLL. Why would that be important for me? Because in, in order to be able to make my exploit run on every machine, I need, you know, we know the exact place of that address. It's 2006 uh, bytes. And now I need a command to put there. And I need to make sure that the place of that command doesn't change when the machine changes. So. Uh, how do they do it? Normally, they use, uh, I think it was address, space, uh, location, randomization, something like that, so that every time I start the DLL or the, the executable, the place changes. So this is, a, in fact, a security function. I see that two uh, uh, components that help me run this application don't use it, were not uh, allowed, so the uh, ASLR is false. One of them is the executable itself, and the other one is a DLL it's using. Okay, I cannot use this one because you know it starts with double zero, and I said that, uh, and I've just seen that uh, null byte was not working with my uh, with this vulnerability, so I cannot use it. The only one I can use is this one. Okay, so now I need to find a jump. So because what I will do is, uh, as I know where I have to put the next command to be executed, I will put a jump there, and I will make a jump to my own exploit so that I can exploit the application. Inside this DLL, I find like nine or ten uh, jump functions. I will just use one. Uh, my exploit, I will use MSF Venom, which is, you know, which used to be uh, MSF Payload and MSF Encode. Now they have put it together. Just it will op open me or give me a reverse shell. This is uh, just maybe an important point. I ask it not to use the null byte because it's a bad character. So if I put it in the exploit, it will cr it will not work. So I just ask it politely not to use it. But the rest is just open me a reverse shell. This is my local host and on this port. So it generates the payload. Just let's maybe go over it. Uh, 
again, let's see if I fail in another application. So I'll just close everything. I don't need the debugger anymore. So this is one server running. And in Kelly. I will just need a listener because I am asking it to open a reverse shell. I'll just start listening on a port. And just let me show you the exploit. Again, it's the same piece uh, of code. It will send 2006 A's, then the location of that jump function I found because I wanted to go there. And uh, instead of putting all these Fs at the end, I will just put the payload I just generated. So, so really simple. I just, I think, need to change this so that works. Exploit. I've sent it, uh, the attack, the length is 3,000 because that's exactly what we needed. And see what happens with the, my listener. It was listening and, well, it got what you might call a shell. So now I'm, you know, inside the Windows machine. So that's basically how it's done. <laughs> Just to go over the process once more with the slides maybe, to make sure everything is okay because we had to go back and forth. This was my fuzzer, you know, just I tried to make uh, the program crash or you know make sure the program gave me an error I run it a few times and I've seen that for it first crashed at 2000 but it was not very usable because whatever input I was sending it it thought that it was something to write on so it was not very exploitable at 3000 it crashed and this time yeah it was okay my command was uh, accepted as such as a command I just needed a string of c characters that were not repeating so that I could uh, you know, develop and locate my uh, exploit. I did this, sent it over, found the location and because it was Big Engine and Little Engine, all these good things, this was my location so that I knew that whatever I sent after this first 2006 bytes would be you know, accepted as a command. Just to make sure, uh, double check, yes, it is accepted as a command. There are some bad characters that, we'll, that we should avoid because it might you know, uh, terminate the string or uh, the line. So just to test them, I'm sending all the characters there are in the world. Test, yes, one of them makes that this is not working, something goes wrong. Now I send the remaining, I start uh, one by one eliminating the characters until I find the good one. I'm lucky that in this case it's uh, null byte. Yes, so it works, it's okay. I'm using the Mona add-on for the Unity debugger just uh, to find the location or you know, uh, the DLL or uh, the other executable I can use to develop, to build an exploit. It gives me uh, two possibilities. The first one is the executable itself and the other one is the DLL it is running. 
because of the address of the executable, I cannot use it. It has a null byte in the address, so it will create a whole bunch of problems. I decide to use uh, the DLL. I need a jump function, again, using Mona. I find a jump function inside the DLL. I use any of them. I took help from uh, MSF Venom to build a payload. So the payload is uh, basically for Windows. It's a reverse shell on TCP. Uh, my local host address, my local port address, so this is the ports it will connect back to. I ask him not to use the null byte and uh, some encoding. And for the output uh, format, I ask it to output in Python. So this is what it generated. I start my listener on my attacking machine. And once I send the payload, everything's back to normal. You will notice that in uh, the last case, the software didn't crash on, on the machine. So here I am connected to it, but if, yeah, Von Serverless is still working, so nothing crashed. Yeah. So this is more or less the process and uh, all the idea behind it. If you have any questions, I can try to answer them. Okay. Yes. So you were telling about uh, deleting traces uh, the server or whatever the Windows machine is, uh, won't he be able uh, to see our IP address or the IP address he's sending? Yes, in, in this case it will. You know, it has seen our, as you can see, it has seen our connection. It has received uh, the connection. So it will be, they will be able to see who connected. In, this is an early stage usually. Uh, this is not how, where I will stop, you know, if this was a real company and if it was a real attack. Once I got in this position, I would use the Windows machine to get a better uh, backdoor or a remote access Trojan because, you know, someone just can close this application or just, they can just shut down their computers and go home. So it's, it's not very usable in real life. So I need to uh, move laterally or, you know, somewhere else. It will, I will leave a trace here, obviously, but I can then go back and delete it. But in the first contact, yes, we will leave this trace. Okay. Thank you very much, then.